Welcome to this WiseOwl tutorial on using sequence containers and for loops within integration services. Here's what you'll learn in the tutorial. We'll begin by having a look at sequence containers. So we'll have a look at the task host container, the default container for everything you add to a package. Then we'll look at how sequence containers work. And finally we'll look at an example of a sequence container. We'll then go on to look at for loops, so we'll see what for loops do and then look at a practical example of a for loop to list out all the prime numbers. So let's get started. Before we have a look at sequence containers, what they are and why you might want to use them, let's first have a look at something called the task host container, which is the name given to the entire package. To show you the constraints this puts on what you do, let's try adding a couple of data flow tasks. There's one and there's another. And what you'll see is it automatically gives the second task a different name. And that's because task names have to be unique within the container. And if I were to try renaming the second task to data flow task as well, when I click somewhere else, it will give me an error and tell me that another object in the collection already uses this name. So you can't have two tasks with the same name. In addition to that, it won't surprise you to know that you can't have two variables with the same name either. So if I call my first variable there i, which is going to hold an integer, if I then had another variable and try calling that one i as well, you can see that when I try to move off it, it gives me the same sort of error message and tells me I can't have two variables with the same name within the task host container. What I'm going to do now is show you how you can overcome this constraint by using something called sequence containers which are independent boxes, each of which can have their own tasks and their own variables. So let's move on to that. What I'm going to do now is to add in a couple of sequence containers. You can do that by dragging the sequence container task from the SSIS toolbox. I'll call my first one box A, showing a singular lack of imagination. And what I'm going to do is copy that task and then <coughs> excuse me and then paste it and guess what I'm going to call the second one. You guessed it, box B. So now I've got my two separate sequence, sequence container tasks. What I want to do is prove that each task that you add within that is independent of any other sequence container. So I'll just make my containers a bit bigger so I can fit things into them. I'm going to add two data flow tasks into box A. I could have used any task I like for this to illustrate it. That's just the one at the top of the list. There's the first and there's the second. And as before, it gives each task a distinct name because within the sequence container, all the tasks have to have unique names. But if I now try adding data flow tasks to box B, you'll see that it's quite happy to give the first task I add a name, data flow task, which is identical to a name in another sequence container. And what this shows is that each sequence container is completely independent. The same thing applies to variables. So if I go down to my variables, what I'm going to do is add a new variable, and I'm going to call it j to show an integer, and set it equal to the value of 1. If I were to add another variable called j, it wouldn't let me, because the scope of that is limited to the entire package, which I've called containers. But what I'm going to do is change the scope of this variable by moving it. It's not a particularly good name, but what I'm going to do is move it to box A. Rather alarmingly, it will disappear, but that's because I don't have box A selected. If I now click on that box A and display my variables, which I'll just pin that, you'll see that the variable called J has appeared. If I click off it, it disappears again. And that's because the scope of it is limited to the sequence container called box A. I can do the same trick to create another variable, which I'll also call J. This time I'll set it to a value of 2. And it's let me do this because the scope of the second variable is the entire package, and the scope of the first one is limited to the box A sequence container. I could do the same trick to move the second variable to box B. And what I've now got, it appears, is no variables whatsoever. But when I click on each sequence container, 
you can see that it pops up with each variable. The first one has got the value of 1, and the second one has got the value of 2. What I want to do now is give a very simple example of how you might use the sequence contain in practice. I've got a simple package here, and what it does is deletes rows from three tables, and then from an Excel workbook of X Factor finalists with which regular viewers will be quite familiar, it imports three worksheets, the list of the people contestants, the list of the series, and the list of the mentors. Having imported those three worksheets into three different tables, what it then does is take the workbook and copies it to another folder. And if I run that package, you'll see it chugging away and finishing, so it's working. It's not too important what the package does, but what I want to emphasize is that these three tasks should all have to run before I can copy the finalist workbook. But there's actually no particular reason that they should run in this sequence. It doesn't matter what order they happen. If I was creating this package, I think a neater solution would be this. Create a sequence container, and let's call it import tables. And then take these three tasks and drag them into the sequence container. Now as it happens, when I do that, it's not going to work. The message it's coming up with is saying I have to remove the precedence constraint before proceeding. So what I'll need to do is break the links between those three tasks and the outside world, and then I'll be able to add, drag the three tasks into the sequence container. What I can then do is take the first task and feed it into the import tables one, and then feed the output of the input tables one into the final copy file task. The final thing I'll be tempted to do is to break the links between my three imports. There's actually no particular reason that I should import the data in this order. It doesn't matter. And by breaking the links, the multi-threading nature of SSIS will allow it to uh, schedule these tasks in the most efficient way. If I then run this package again, you should see that it does exactly the same thing as it did before. And you'll have to take that on trust. But you can see it's finished the beauty of it is, is that these three tasks have been confined to a sequence container, so I've got more control over when they run. It also, of course, allows me to move that around anywhere I like on the screen, and the three tasks contained within it will follow it. What I want to do now is show a particular type of container called a for-loop container. They're not actually that useful. For-each-loop containers are far more useful and they allow you to iterate over files and records, but we'll cover those in a later tutorial. For now, let's just look at the humble for loop. What I'll do is add one of those tasks into my package and rename it to count from 1 to 10. And that's actually an indication of what the loop is going to do. It's probably the least ambitious package I've ever written. In order to be able to count, I need a variable to hold the counter. So I'll add a variable and I'll call it i. Nice short name. And it doesn't actually matter what value it will hold initially because the for loop will overwrite it. There's a red cross which tells me I haven't yet configured my for loop. So what I can do is double click on the symbol at the top left and set three things. The initial expression, the assign expression, and the evaluation expression. And probably I'll do it in that order. The initial expression is I want to set the value of the variable called i equal to one. You'll notice there's yet another way of referring to variables. This time, I can proceed in them with the at sign. It's very similar to how it works in SQL, for those who know that. My assign expression, each time around the loop, will take the value of the variable called i and set it equal to one more than it used to be. And that's a standard programming convention to get a variable to increase by one each time around a loop. What I now need to do is to set something called the evaluation expression which specifies an expression that will stop the loop when the expression evaluates to false. So what I'll do here is say that the variable called i has to be less than 10. And so what it will do is set the variable to 1, increase it by 1 each time around the loop, and keep going for as long as it's less than 10. So if I choose OK, let's try running that. I think it's going to be a bit disappointing, because while it runs, there's actually no evidence that it did anything useful. So what I'll do this time 
is right click on the for loop and set breakpoints, edit breakpoints. And what I'm going to do is add a breakpoint to the on post execute event. And what that means is when the this particular task is finished executing, it will take me into debug mode so I can inspect the value of my variable. If I run it again now, the same thing will happen, but this time you can see the yellow arrow shows it's paused. And what I can now do is have a look at my locals window, for example, debug windows locals, and you can see there's my variable called i, and it has a value 10. So it was increased once each time around the loop until it reached a value which was no longer less than 10. So that's a simple for loop. What I'll do is just finish running it, or rather abort it. And what we'll do now is look at a practical example of this. What I'd like to do now is to show a slightly useful example of a for loop in practice. I've got a package here, what it will do is loop over all the primes, or rather all the numbers. For each integer it will test if it's prime, and if it is it will add it to the list. And the end result will be a script which will display the value of the first n primes. Here I've set n to be 100, or at least I'm testing all the integers up to 100. If I run that package, you'll see the output of it is a list of all the primes, 2, 3, 5, 7, etc. What I'll now do is show you how we did that. So I'll just close that down and go back to one I've partially created earlier. This already creates the script at the bottom, which will display the output of the final message. What it doesn't do is contain either any variables or the for loop itself. So the first thing I need to do is create three variables. The first one I'm going to call test number, and that will be the integer I'm testing to see if it's prime. The second variable I'm going to call max number, and that will be the highest number I'm going to go up to. So I'm going to test the first hundred numbers so that we're not here all day. And the third variable I'm going to call prime string, and that will be a string variable which I will initialize to 2. And the reason for that is I want to begin assuming that 2 is non-prime and test only the odd numbers to speed things up. Having created those variables, what I can now do is to create my for loop. So I'll add that in here. and I'll call it test primes. And I'll configure it to say that the initial expression should be that the test number should be 3. I'm going to start with the first odd number. The assign, exp assign expression should be that each time around the loop, I'll set the test number to be two more than it used to be, so I'll test the, all the odd numbers, three, five, seven, etc. And the evaluation expression is that I'll keep going until the test number is less than or equal to the maximum number I've specified, which in this case is 100. What I then need to do is add a script within the for loop, and what this will do is test if prime. So we'll test each number to see if it's prime. If I double click on that, I need to pass in two variables. As a read-only variable, I need to pass in the number I'm testing to see if it's prime. Otherwise the script won't know what it is, it's testing. And as a write-only variable, I need to modify the prime string. So I need to add a prime to the string if it is indeed prime. What I can then do is edit my script and I've got something in my clipboard, I hope, so if I just paste it in there. I'm not especially proud of this. What it will do is find out what the number is, and then what it does is loop from, create a variable called i, and loops from 2 all the way up to the maximum number I'm, test, the number I'm testing, which in this case is test number. The percent symbol divides the number I'm testing by an integer and looks at the remainder of it. And if that remainder is zero, you can assume the number was perfectly divisible and it's not prime. If we get all the way through that loop, I'll just clear that, and we haven't found it, it's not prime, it must be prime. In which case, we add the number onto the end of the string and then end the script. What I now need to do is just to connect those two tasks up. The second script passes in the highest number and the prime string and just displays it. And you'll see in here there's just a message box displaying the message primes up to this number are a couple of carriage returns and then the list of primes we built up. 
So what we now need to do is see if this actually works. To make it fair, I'll set it to be the start of object so you can see there's no trickery going on. And if I now execute that package, you should see that it lists out all the primes. And that completes this look at for loops. What I would do now is to go on to look at some of the tutorials on for each loops. There's a couple. There's one on files and one on records because they're far more useful in practice. Now we've got the basic idea in place. You can find loads more training resources on integration services, other aspects of SQL Server, .NET and Microsoft Office at www.wiseowl.co.uk.